So during COVID, while well, we're all isolated within the forests of our own homes and minds in our caves, we can do vipassana, gamatan, meditation. Yeah. So what is vipassana, gamatan, forest tradition meditation? Well, before that, I would say you would first to want to do that, you would have to have understood the first of the four first teachings of the Buddha. Anybody who considers himself a true Buddhist would uh, understand first what is the first four basic teachings of the Buddha, the, per the four noble truths. So to understand each of them deeply. And to do that, one actually first only really needs to understand the first of those Four Noble Truths, which is where I'm going to bring up a slight doubt, which I shouldn't bring up. And that doubt is that the practice of Vipassana Gamatan, in one way, is to suppress reactions, meaning emotions, reactions to thoughts, emotions of anger or good feeling, sadness or happiness, excitement, lust or whatever. But that before you uh, develop the desire to practice Vipassana Gamatan, because you have seen Dukkha, the first noble truth, suffering. That's what makes you have a reason to practice. And here is the irony that to know suffering and have seen suffering, in truth, really, um, you have to not suppress the emotions. You have to allow them to happen so that you can observe them in Vipassana. Now lately, as an unenlightened person, who believes he understands the path to enlightenment, have my own way of doing it, instead of using vipassana gamatan to suppress emotion, I have allowed it to arise within me. This was assisted by the loss of my beloved dog, which uh, immersed me in grief and sorrow and I allowed it to happen and I questioned myself and told myself off that I wasn't practicing Vipassana Gamatan properly as a Dharma warrior by just focusing on my breath and suppressing the uh, afflictive emotion meaning suffering because inner suffering is basically, the Buddha would say, afflictive emotions, as far as I know. Emotions which are afflictions, such as anger or grief or sorrow or loneliness, and so on. Yeah? And the Dharma warrior learns to suppress this. Why does the Dharma warrior suppress this emotion and disturbing thoughts which cause the emotion? Because he is dousing suffering extinguishing suffering, which is the meaning of the amulet of the Buddha with his hands over his eyes, the prapita. The reason the prapita is closing his orifices, his eyes and mouth and ears, is because he is cutting off all of the sources of sensations or perceptions which will cause thoughts to arise, which will then cause emotions to arise. These thoughts and emotions which arise in the mind and cause secretions of adrenaline or dopamine or whichever to make you angry or flee or fight or fight, flight or play dead, get angry or feel sad. The meditator enters the cave and the forest of his mind and he steps apart and watches his brain thinking and watches his brain cause secretions to make his body feel uncomfortable, which gives the illusion of what we call emotion. He does this so that he can extinguish the 
dukkha vetana, the afflictive emotion and the disturbances of thoughts, which are like if you throw pebbles in a still lake, that's like thinking, it's causing ripples. These ripples on the surface of the still lake or thoughts arising within the stillness of the mind are disturbances to the stillness, to the peace of Nibbana, which is absolute stillness. And so the Prapita Kaunirod, the Prapita amulet is called Kaunirod because Nirod or Niroda means the extinguishing of all suffering. So he cuts it all out through suppression of emotion in Vipassana Kamatan. But why is he practicing all of this to extinguish the suffering? Because he has seen the suffering within, with the inner eye, the Dharma eye. And that is the first noble truth of the four noble truths of the Buddha. And that's where you begin. You begin to follow the Buddhist path. That's where you begin. Because you see suffering. And so, after that you learn to suppress suffering. I have learned to do that, but I have allowed it to arise, which is the irony I was speaking of. Because instead of suppressing my suffering and grief of the loss of my dog, I allowed the suffering to arise. Well, I lost control and it just arose. I didn't have enough power, basically. But something good came from it. The good thing that came from it was that by allowing all of the emotion to come out and to sob every day, ten times a day for the loss of my beloved dog allowed me to see suffering much more clearly. I have already seen suffering but in this case the suffering was so great by allowing it to happen instead of suppressing it it gave me a much clearer view of the existence of suffering and this was beneficial to seeing the Dharma. Therefore, the first noble truth that suffering exists and that there are afflict afflictive emotions such as lot, sorrow and grief and anger. Um, in order to accept and know this truth, you need to see it. And to see the first noble truth of suffering, of dukkha, of afflictive emotion, inner suffering, one has to suffer. You have to go through hell before you go to heaven. There is no hell or heaven except in your own mind. But it's a saying that explains the same meaning. So I shall now destroy the doubt and irony that why when Vipassana says suppress suffering, emo afflictive emotions, but the first noble truth to see suffering, you need to have experienced affective emotion. And here is where it gets destroyed. That the allowing of suffering to happen comes first, before you start practicing, so that you can see suffering. And then, when you see suffering, you then decide you want to learn how to suppress it. You wish to learn how to suppress it and you develop this desire, which is an auspicious desire, although all desires should be destroyed, this desire should not be destroyed because it's auspicious. It is destroyed later when you don't need it. I will then like to use the illusion of, which the Buddha used very often, of the raft. He said the raft is something that you use to get across the river. But once you've crossed the river, you don't carry it with you. So the raft is just a tool to get across the river with. Which means that uh, desire, we will compare with the raft, the, the desire to become enlightened. An enlightened person doesn't have desires. And so the desire to become enlightened is an irony in itself. Because you can't become enlightened whilst you still have desire. And that auspicious desire to become enlightened is the raft, which should not be thrown away until one has reached either enlightenment or the path to enlightenment, stream entry, after which 
one does not need no raft because it's a snowball effect. So there you go, that is the, one of the rafts that you carry with you uh, and you get rid of, the, use the auspicious desires to get rid of the inauspicious desires. And then slowly, like a snake, you shed yourself of each of the lesser auspicious desires. And from that point, the ball starts rolling, the Dharma wheel starts turning. And once it starts turning inside you, as a process, that you have first allowed suffering to happen and seen it, and developed the desire to extinguish it by observing oneself, through one's grief or one's anger or one's sorrow or one's loss or one's whichever feeling of afflictive emotion that is dukkha, that is suffering as we call it, it allows you to see the first noble truth. Unless you have seen this suffering, you cannot develop the auspicious desire to extinguish it and find an end to suffering, which uh, is the second noble truth. And so if you see the first noble truth of suffering, you get to see the second automatically. And so the second noble truth, first being dukkha, afflictive emotion, is samutaya. All things that have a beginning have an end because all things are impermanent. First mark of the three marks of existence. Yeah? If there is a beginning of suffering, there must hence be also an end. To suffering. Yeah? That is the second noble truth, samutiya. Yeah? The first is dukkha, afflictive emotion exists. The second is samutiya. There is a cause to suffering. If you see the first noble truth of suffering, then you seek the end of it. You wish to you develop the desire to end it to extinguish it. Therefore, you have seen also that there is an end to suffering. This is because suffering has a cause, which is the heart of the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. Yeah? All things have a beginning and an end. Yeah? And samutaya is the beginning part. It is the cause of suffering, which is clinging. So the first noble truth is dukkha suffering, yeah, as people call it. And the second noble truth is that suffering has a cause, samutaya, yeah? and that cause is clinging. Clinging to what? Clinging to things such as when we don't accept the fact my dog has run away or died and I'm so sad, as I have told you, uh, my uh, recent experience, Clinging to the fact that we cannot change the world or make it do as we wish. Clinging to political ideas or clinging to religious beliefs. Uh, things that can make you sad or angry. Uh, clinging to wanting to possess things. Clinging to things you love which get old and die. Clinging to one's youth and suffering because you observe the loss of your youth, as you find the first grey hair, or the first tooth falls out, or you get the first backache, and bone ache, and rheumatism, and so on. In fact, it was the Buddha's lack of knowledge, not clinging, but lack of knowledge, uh, the fact that we get old, sick, age, and eventually die, and lose our loved ones, and they lose us which allowed him to receive the message from the four angelic messengers, <coughs> the heavenly messengers, which was uh, a sick person, an aged person, a corpse, and a meditator. It was the first thing he saw as a clueless prince who believed everybody stayed young forever and never saw anything but beauty. And he realized that there was sickness aging, death, but then the fourth messenger was a guy sat under a tree meditating, a Rusi, and he saw this Rusi, or this ascetic, who was a mendicant, 
a beggar ascetic, forest ascetic, and he saw he looked so peaceful and different from everybody else, and he decided that he wanted to follow that path. And so this mendicant ascetic made an impression on him, and as the story goes, he went to the palace and was asleep with his wife and child, and he had a dream where he was in a room and the walls started closing in on him, and it was getting smaller and smaller and going to crush him. But this was because he was affected by these four things, the sick person, uh, the aged person, the dead corpse, and the peaceful looking ascetic, which was making him feel closed in that he would have to be a prince and a king and execute people and so on. That his decision was highly influenced by the fourth messenger. He was shocked by the first three, the corpse, the sick person, the aged person, by these realizations that we're gonna die. But it was the fourth, the ascetic, which inspired him. It was the peaceful look on the face of the ascetic which inspired him and which caused him to have the dream of um, being closed in with the walls closing in because he wanted to go and live the ascetic life. But he had to become a king. And that, of course, is when he escaped and ran away, left his wife and kid and his dad the king and his mom the queen and he went to the forest and exchanged his fancy clothes with an ascetic or with a poor man and became an, cut off his hair and became an ascetic. The strange thing is really that um, he did not really see uh, Dukkha. He saw it in other people. He saw the suffering of other people and that suffering exists and this led him to become an ascetic. But with us, it's a little bit different. Why is it different? Well, the Buddha had already attained a lot of merits and was able to achieve things that we don't have the strength to achieve, most of us. Some people might. Very few people, once in a while in history, there will be, but otherwise not. It's also different because he didn't experience dukkha. He was a prince who was not allowed to see that, dukkha, that suffering existed or that aging and sickness and loss and poverty and such existed. This kind of misery, he was not allowed to see it. But for us to understand the Dhamma that he explained, which existed before him, the true nature of all things, that's the word, meaning of the Dhamma. His, the teaching of the Buddha is the Dhamma. But the Dhamma is the true nature of all things, which is the cosmic law. And that was there since the beginning of time. But for us to understand his teaching and to wish to practice, we have to experience Dukkha, not just see that it exists. We have to feel it. And so first, uh, it is important to have experienced suffering because the first word of his teaching is Dukkha, Samutaya, Niroda, Makkha, I have the Four Noble Truths. Dukkha, afflictive emotion exists, first Noble Truth. Samutaya, there is a cause of that suffering. But because all things have a beginning and an end, there is also uh, a way to end that suffering. Yeah? And uh, the end of the suffering is the third noble truth, Niroda, the extinguishing of suffering. Yeah? And so to have suffered, seen suffering, want to practice, then uh, begin to practice and learn to extinguish the suffering, the Dukkha Vetana, the inner afflictive emotions, is precisely to enter into these Four Noble Truths of experiencing and seeing dukkha, suffering, and knowing that the cause, what the cause is, what you're clinging to, and trying to extinguish it. So in Buddhist academics, those are the first three of the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, dukkha, um, Cause of suffering, samutaya, 
extinguishing of suffering niroda and there is a path this path is the path to the end of all suffering yeah? and um, this path the Buddha called it Makkha which of course means path in Pali in the in Makata what he spoke at the time was called the uh, Makbad or the uh, Atamakka uh, which means the Eightfold Path because he split the ways of practicing it into eight different qualities. The Noble Eightfold Path was the fourth Noble Truth that is suffering exists, there is a cause of suffering, there is an end to suffering therefore there must be a way, a path to end that suffering and that path is the Eightfold Path. Yeah. And so the Eightfold Path was a list of various qualities such as having right view, right concentration, right um, uh, effort and so on. Yeah? Up to eight different things. Each of which must be explained in themselves. So I shall be leaving that for another day because the Noble Eightfold Path each uh, aspect of personality or how you are, how you become, how you must be, it must be explained in detail because each different one such as right view or right concentration is a lot deeper than most people understand and uh, the first sermon of the Buddha explains the Buddha explains in the Dharma Chakra, when you see a Buddha statue like this, it means he is teaching the Dharma, giving his first sermon. And his first sermon was basically telling the five students, his five, first five students, how he achieved enlightenment. And this explanation of how he achieved enlightenment was basically went through a list of eight achievements of attaining these eight factors, of en eight uh, aspects of enlightenment. Right view, right concentration. But he explained how he attained right view. So to achieve right concentration, that doesn't mean good meditation. It means achieving fourth jhana completely, which means entering the fourth state of absorption, which takes many years of hard practice, if you ever achieve it at all. Some people never do. So this right effort, one of eight things which need to be fully realized, um, means the four right exertions to leave the bad deeds of the past behind and to preserve the good deeds of the past is two of them. And the other two are of course to uh, commit only good deeds in the present and future uh, and which actually is the way to leave behind the bad deeds of the past and to avoid any bad deeds in the present and future. And so, in truth, because the past is behind us, all we can do is the present and future. These four right exertions can be reduced to two practices of only being skillful and avoiding being unskillful. By being skillful, you get rid of the bat, the unskillful acts of the past. You leave them behind. And by never being unskillful, you avoid destroying the good auspicious acts of the past. In addition, of course, by being skillful, you sleep well every night with no regrets. And by not being unskillful, you don't have uns uh, sleepless nights full of regrets and so this results in more peace and happiness which makes you more able to practice. So remember that by fulfilling these four right exertions, the four samapatana, yeah, just by doing the two things, being skillful and don't be unskillful, huh? or if you're religious and want to condition sinful and meritorious, be meritorious, don't be sinful. Remember that these two things, two practices, which are the four right exertions to 
keep the good things of the past, get rid of the bad things of the past, make good things for the now and the future, and avoid bad things for the now and the future. Fulfillment of those four things is right effort. And so right effort is only one of the eight characteristics you have to develop and become from second nature within yourself in order to become an arahant, an enlightened being. That is right effort. Right effort is to fulfill the teaching of the four samapadanas, the four uh, correct exertions, which is another teaching and have to fulfill. And so just seeing one of these eight aspects of the Eightfold Path is a practice in itself of the four exertions and to fulfill and fully realize, make it real within yourself is one of the aspects. Just shows you how big the Eightfold Path is. Anyway, as I said, I'm not going to teach the Eightfold Path right now. But that is a basic overview of Buddhism and the main thing was to see suffering is the first thing that makes you become a believer in the Buddha and his teachings. And that to see suffering and feel it must come first so that one can wish to extinguish it and then practice. But that the practice itself is to not feel suffering, it is to extinguish it. And there was the irony in myself allowing myself to suffer. Because I have been a monk uh, and learned that is the practice, I found it strange why I was allowing myself to suffer. And also disappointed in my lack of strength to be able to focus and bring myself out of that suffering. But uh, I believe it was part of my natural evolution and that uh, you're ready for things when you are, but that coming out of it, I have seen suffering on a much deeper level. And this has allowed me to um, strengthen my forces to pull myself together when I meditate and strengthen my reasons for understanding understanding that the only way out is to let go of clinging to the facts that maybe my dog will never come back maybe he's dead and I can keep looking for him forever if I want but should I suffer? the point is that time is a healer and after time you see that the suffering is intolerable but it always happens again. With enlightenment, it doesn't happen again. With non-enlightenment, we forget. The next time my new dog dies, I will be sad again. And so, in order to see suffering, let it out. Suffer and see it. Once you've seen it, you will develop the desire to extinguish it. And that's when you can begin to practice meditation and check out the techniques taught by the Buddha. Once you've let it out and seen the suffering, you can then begin to practice because you will understand the reason why to meditate. Because you want to still the mind and still the suffering that's going on within. And this is seeing the first noble truth. And that's why I began by saying that as a Buddhist and as a practitioner, it only makes sense if you have seen the first noble truth. O oh, Dukkha, Dukkha Vetana, suffering within, dissatisfactoriness, in order to have a reason to practice. And the practice of Vipassana Gamatan, to extinguish suffering, entails beginning with Anabana Sati, of the four Satipatthanas, examination of mindfulness, mindfulness of the body. This is where it begins, using mindfulness of the breath, not forcing it, just be mindful. If you can't feel it here, you can use somewhere else. Most people will begin learning from here. Second will be to know it here and here and here. And then finally to be mindful constantly of all three 
or four points, the abdomen, lower abdomen of the diaphragm, the chest rising and falling, passing down the windpipe, passing through the tip of the nose. That would be all four of the first satipatthana of mindfulness of body is to become aware of all these points of breath at the same time. But you begin with just one point as an anchor to still the mind so you can watch your brain thinking. Those who forget themselves, as you say, will be lucky and fall into deeper levels of absorption by using the breath, watching the mind, noticing the arising and falling of thoughts and emotions which come thereafter. And through this, you will notice, of course, that all things are impermanent, even thoughts and feelings, because you will see them arising and ceasing. The Buddha did not really focus on the arising part of things. He focused on the cessation of things. And so, just by this practice of the breath, you start to notice things like impermanence, which is the first of the three marks of existence. All things are impermanent, all things are dissatisfactory, dukkha, lead to suffering, and all things are not self. And so, really, just through this practice of breath, one only has to have seen the first noble truth of suffering for all of the other three noble truths to happen within the mind automatically like a snowball effect. And then with meditation, which you will want to do, you will then see in the meditation, as you slowly become more deeply absorbed, things like the three marks of existence. And so the four noble truths, the three marks of existence, the five aggregates within the body, all of these things. As an academic, they seem so complicated and so much to study and understand. But if you just do the simple mindfulness of breath meditation, after having suffered and seen suffering and wanting to meditate to still it, all the rest will follow automatically without the academics. And so, letting it out and suffering and then practicing meditation and seeing what happens within and what realizations arise on the path through mindfulness of breath is a snowball effect and this will lead you if you really practice properly and observe your mind within and every time your mind wanders do not worry about the second proliferation of thought of damn it I've lost I forgot to concentrate just go straight back to meditation on the breath and you will then see and you will understand the five aggregates the five candors you will see there is form there is feelings yeah there is conditioned thoughts there is uh, consciousness there is perception and the five candors such a complex thing academically. Rup, Vetana, Sanya, Sankhan, Vinyan, form, feeling, perception slash memory, um, conditioned thoughts and consciousness, awareness of the event, the sense of a self. The sense of a self, which means an observer, somebody who is experiencing this event. Yeah? But actually, there's just an event happening. There is nobody experiencing it. There is a consciousness of the event. But we have the illusion of an experience. Why do we have this illusion of an experience? An experience of a nice day in the park? Yeah? Um, well, because of conditioned mind and because of the false view of a self that doesn't exist as we see it. But for he who is in the fourth absorption, the fourth genre of absorption, where mind stops thinking, or for he who has entered Nirvana, uh, who has become fully enlightened, there is not a self. This is not happening to me. It's just happening. And so for the unenlightened, this day is raining on my birthday. This is happening to me. To an enlightened being, 
who is pure, because enlightenment is purity of these impure, false views. For such an unenlightened being, this would not be happening to him or her. It would just be something happening. Just like the birds singing in the trees. They're not singing to me, they're just singing. The waves are just moving, it's nothing personal. And so when we have wrong view, we think, why is this happening to me? But he who has right view would say, it's not happening to you, it's just happening. And maybe it just seems to be happening, when actually nothing's really happening. And so, I will end this talk now by saying that, first, see suffering in order to be a true practitioner and wish, develop the wish to get rid of it and use mindfulness of breath to be, get rid of it. Therefore, see the first noble truth is of highest importance and the rest will come and the right reasons for practice will be there. And don't worry about all the academics because all that complex stuff you will realize on yourself. And so there you go, the irony between somebody who has practiced to suppress emotional suffering, allowing himself to suffer deeply with emotion, which is actually the second Satipatthana. Because the second Satipatthana, which comes after what I explained about the mindfulness of breath in four steps, which is the first Satipatthana, mindfulness of body. The second one is mindfulness of emotions, of feelings and sensations. And so, although I have learned the path to the end of suffering is extinguishing suffering, I've learned that through jhana meditation, that extinguishes suffering temporarily, but only enlightenment and fully letting go of clinging, which is enlightenment and purity of self, of mind, is the path. Despite this, I have seen that through the second Satipatthana, needing you to be mindfulness of feelings, you need to allow those feelings to arise and watch them. You just need to observe them, even the suffering ones in order to be able to concentrate on them. And so sometimes the practice is jhana, to extinguish suffering temporarily, to experience what Nibbana would be like. But also, before you do that in the second Satipatthana, it is important to allow feelings to arise so you can observe them. In the same way in the third Satipatthana, or the four Satipatthanas, you would watch the mind. And in the last, you watch all other phenomena, all dharmas, dhammas meaning phenomena. And so there you go. The first noble truth of suffering is important. This creates the cause of the desire, auspicious desire, the raft, which you will get rid of later, to bring you to wish to meditate and to practice and to find how to extinguish your suffering, which you have seen and felt. Later on, you will see that that desire was ego-based, but auspicious, but at the point when it no longer becomes necessary, just like a raft, once you have crossed that river, you will not drag it with you across the fields and up the mountains with you. For indeed, the raft is no longer needed to cross the river with once you have achieved that state you no longer need that piece of the practice that tool once you don't need it anymore you throw it away because once you've got rid of all of the inauspicious desires which lead to wrong view and suffering and you have developed all of the auspicious causes of enlightenment then you no longer need that desire. There will come a point where the desire to become enlightened will be one of the final rafts you throw away to get across the river with, to the far shore, as the Buddha called it, to reach the far shore, 
Once you have reached the far shore, you will throw away your final raft, because desire is clinging, and clinging is the cause of suffering. And uh, seeing suffering through having suffered, and observing your mind and why you are suffering, what's causing you to suffer in meditation, will lead you to this conclusion. But some parts of practice, up until enlightenment, are auspicious forms of clinging, which get rid of the inauspicious forms of clinging. And therefore, it's like a series of tools, which are rafts, which can be thrown away once you don't need them anymore. And so to say, from the beginning, do not cling to anything at all, is it firstly impossible, because only enlightened beings can do that, and secondly, is that you need to cling to certain auspicious values in order to get rid of the inauspicious ones. But it is also important to see that it is clinging itself that leads to suffering and that clinging is something that must be got rid of. But the auspicious forms of clinging that bring you to enlightenment are like rafts because if you use them like rafts, which can be thrown away once you don't need them anymore, then these are auspicious forms of clinging which can be used as tools for enlightenment. For indeed, the Buddha said that in order to become enlightened, the first problem is that all we have to get rid of the conditioned mind, the unenlightened mind, is the conditioned mind. All we have to destroy conditioned thoughts with are conditioned thoughts. It's the only tool we have. Therefore, these conditioned thoughts that we use, we can use one conditioned thought to destroy another conditioned thought. So we may have a conditioned thought which is completely wrong and we want to destroy it. So we use a model in our mind to destroy it with such as clinging is the cause of suffering. The concept of clinging and the concept of causes are both human concepts and only exist in the minds of humans. And they don't really exist, they're empty. They're imaginary, but they work as tools. They work as tools for communication, for understanding, and they help us to lead ourselves and others to understanding the true nature of things, or as you say in Buddhism, the Dhamma, the Buddha Dhamma. But they are rafts, and once you don't need them, you throw them away. Because they are conditioned thoughts and ideas, and they are only used as tools for explanation. But all things are empty in nature, and not self, and we are all connected through dependent origination and one and the same. So I'd like to wish us all good luck on the path and that one day we attain right view through the Eightfold Path. And uh, this has been useful for both beginners and intermediate and advanced learners of the Dhamma. John Spencer signing off. See you again next time from my world. I'm off back to hyperspace. <laughs>